Good afternoon, uh, colleagues. The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions, and the portfolio this afternoon is social justice, housing, and local government. I'd remind members wishing to ask a supplementary to press the request to speak buttons during the uh, relevant question. And I call question number one, Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it is promoting the current consultation on the mobility component of the adult disability payment in light of reported concerns of campaigners that the eligibility criteria unfairly downgrade benefits for those with conditions such as MS. Minister Ben McPherson. Adult disability payment was developed in close cooperation with disabled people. We have made several improvements to provide a far more positive experience compared to personal independence payment, which it replaced. And Social Security Scotland seek to apply the eligibility criteria fairly and consistently to get more decisions right first time. We have been raising awareness of the consultation on the eligibility criteria for the mobility element of adult disability payment through stakeholders, including disabled people's organisations, and through consultation events. And we are encouraging people to reply to the consultation and tell us about their experiences of adult disability payment. Full McGregor. Yeah, I thank the Minister for that answer. Does he agree with the MS Society who have been in touch with me regarding this issue that assessing an individual's mobility cannot solely be evaluated in their ability to walk on a flat surface for 20 metres, as this does not take into account variable surfaces and fatigue that takes place after exertion. Will the analysis of the consultation take this into account? Minister. Uh, it, it's essential that Social Security Scotland make person-centred decisions uh, that take individual circumstances into account. And that is why Social Security Scotland case managers have training and guidance to consider the individual mobility needs of disabled people. That includes uh, how to take into account the impact of pain, fatigue and fluctuating conditions, starting from a position of trust. The consultation asks people to give their views on the eligibility criteria for the mobility component, including the 20 metre rule uh, and the impact of fluctuating conditions. Uh, we encourage people to contribute to the consultation and the analysis will reflect people's views on this matter. A couple of supplementaries. First, Jeremy Balfour, who joins us remotely. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Can I ask the Minister, if the rule was extended, uh, the mobility rule was extended from 20 to 50 metres, how much would that cost? And if he doesn't know the figure, can you write to me at a later stage with that figure? Minister. I'm happy to take the, the point away on behalf of the member. Uh, these are, of course, important considerations uh, with regard to the financial position. Uh, however, at the moment, I would encourage people to uh, reply to the consultation on the issue. And Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, President Officer. The Government promised that there would be pre consultation engagement with stakeholders, but conversations I've had with those in the sector suggest that this didn't really happen. So, can I ask the Minister to set out more detail on any pre consultation engagement and which organisations the Government engaged with? Minister, in brief as possible. We engage with stakeholders with regard to adult disability payment uh, on a regular basis. And, um, I think the most important thing now for all of us, uh, for the collective common good, is that we encourage people to contribute to the consultation, which I know that Pam Duncan Glancy has done through our social media. I, I thank her for that, uh, and I encourage others to do the same. Question two, Ariane Burgess. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made on delivering the Butte House Agreement commitment to ensure that community housing trusts are adequately funded so that they can support the delivery of enhanced rural home building plans. Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'm delighted to say that we have made significant progress in delivering this commitment. And last week, I met with the Community Housing Trust to provide an update. I recognise the vital support that these organisations are continuing to provide in rural and island areas to ensure the delivery of the right homes in the right places that will meet the needs of communities. My officials will continue to progress this as a priority strand of the Remote Rural Islands Housing Action Plan, and I'll provide further details shortly. Ariane Burgess. <coughs> I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that encouraging answer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that community housing trusts play a vital role in making sure that affordable housing and placemaking is delivered in some of our most rural remote, uh, rural remote areas where the addition or return to use of only a small number of homes can make the difference to whether a school or a shop stays open or closes? And that and that is why the agreement between the Green MSPs and the Scottish Government attaches such importance to securing their funding. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yeah, I, I fully recognise the important work undertaken by Community Housing Trust to support the delivery of more affordable homes in 
rural and island communities and where delivery of what we may think of as a small number of homes can make a, a big difference in terms of sustainability to a local economy and to public services and to help uh, with the retention of people in an area, particularly young people. So I've seen it firsthand that high quality energy efficient homes delivered by communities through the Rural and Islands Housing Fund, including in Fort Augustus and Stracathro, and I've heard from tenants how these projects have made a significant impact in our local communities. A couple of supplementaries. First, Jenny Minto. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Government has been active in identifying innovative, way, innovative ways to finance the pledge for 110,000 affordable homes by 2032, of which 10 per cent will be in our rural and island communities. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that this rural focus has been successfully built into the Scottish Government's housing strategy going forward? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, um, we are making £3.5 billion available through the Affordable Housing Supply Programme this parliamentary term to support the delivery of the ambitious target of 110,000 affordable homes by 2032. Um, this includes support of up to £30 million through our demand-led Rural and Island Housing Fund for communities and organisations not able to access traditional affordable housing funding, and it works alongside our wider affordable housing uh, Fund. It will also shortly publish the Remote Rural and Islands Housing Action Plan to support the delivery of homes in rural and island communities. And briefly, Willie Rennie. I strongly support the Community Housing Trust model alongside the use of rural housing burdens. I think it can play an important role in constituencies like mine in the East Nuke, where there's a real problem with the growth of second homes and holiday lets. But not many councils know about this power or these trusts outside the Highland areas. So what more can the government do to encourage the use of this model in places like Fife? Cabinet Secretary. I, I think Willie Rennie make, makes a fair point, and I would hope with the, the, the new remote rural and islands plan alongside the, the funding um, sustainability of community housing trusts that are, as Willie Rennie points out, are operating mainly in the north of Scotland and the south of Scotland, that they will be able to share some of that good practice and perhaps expand some of the good work that they're doing, because we know it's a model that works, and I'm happy to keep them appraised of that. Question number three, Paul O'Kane. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to tackle any, any economic inequalities faced by unpaid carers. Minister Christina McKelvey. Um, thank you, President Officer. We value all carers for their contribution, which is why our carer strategy sets out what the Scottish Government is doing to tackle the economic inequalities faced by unpaid carers. It takes a cross-government approach to financial inclusion, including through social security and supporting carers in employment and education. And the Carers Allowance Supplement, which will be five years old this year, and the Young Carers Grant, our Scottish government benefits only available in Scotland that are vital in this and are providing further financial support to unpaid carers. Those receiving carers allowance supplement this year will receive an extra £541 more than those in the rest of the UK. Paul O'Kane. I thank the Minister for her answer. As we move into spring and summer, we are all hopeful for some needed respite from household expenditure with energy use dropping. However, that is little comfort to tens of thousands of households across Scotland who continue to exist on the precipice of financial insecurity due to exorbitant energy bills. Unpaid carers indeed face significantly higher energy costs as they must often operate essential life-sustaining equipment. In this chamber, in response to questions from myself and my colleague Jackie Bailey, the Government have previously stated that they would look to provide additional support for for unpaid carers for that life-sustaining equipment, but no detail has yet been forthcoming. So I would ask the Minister if and when the Government plans to publish details and perhaps a timetable for such additional funding to be made available to carers. Minister. Um, thanks very much. Paul Kane makes a, a, a very serious point here about the impact of the cost of living crisis. We have heard those same concerns from all of the organisations and support organisations and carers that, that, that we know. Um, and introducing the Carers Allowance Supplement you know, alleviates that in, in some way. And the specific points around about health and um, medical equipment is an issue that the Health Secretary is dealing with. And I will ensure he can get that response on that point to Paul Kane as quickly as possible. And brief supplementary, Beatrice Wishart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. My MP colleague Wendy Chamberlain is taking a bill through the UK Parliament which would give unpaid carers the right to take leave from their job. What additional steps can the Scottish Government take to support unpaid carers and ensure any inequalities faced by uncarers are addressed? Minister. 
Yeah, thanks very much to Beatrice Wishart for that um, question. And I think I'll look with interest to Wendy Chamberlain's work on this, because she knows uh, employment law is, is uh, reserved to, to Westminster. However, we have heard those same concerns from carers and their support organisations about the impact of um, the, the challenges around about work and the rules that come uh, alongside that as well. And we do have our fair work um, principles that we are working on right now. And we will publish a response in, in, in the coming weeks around about carer support payment, um, which has just been a, a highlighted in a recent consultation. So we can come back with that information when we have that consultation analysis. Okay. Question number four, Katie Clark. To ask the Scottish Government whether it has plans to reform the compulsory purchase order process to make it easier to convert empty buildings into council housing. Cabinet Secretary. Local authorities already have broad compulsory purchase powers to support a range of development and regeneration projects, including bringing vacant, derelict and underused land or property back into productive use. The Scottish Government remains committed to reforming and modernising the compulsory purchase system in Scotland and to make it fairer, clearer and faster for all parties. Katie Clark. An estimated 112,300 properties in Scotland are unoccupied at any one time, with nearly 30,000 empty for over a year. Over 130,000 people are homeless or on waiting lists. Will the Scottish Government carry out an analysis of how compulsory purchase orders are currently being used with the aim of making it easier for councils to provide housing to those in need? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so, so two things on that. Uh, first of all, an audit of empty homes is currently underway uh, to gather evidence about the effectiveness of our current approach and help with thinking on options for future policy and funding. I should say that through the Scottish Empty Homes Partnership, it has already helped to return more than 8,000 uh, homes back into use as uh, warm, safe and secure housing for those who need it. Um, we are going to be, uh, as a first step, um, st um, establishing an advisory board that will be appointed to help inform the development of options for reform of the compulsory purchase order uh, process, because I think it is important that we look at what levers we have, but also what additional levers we need, because I absolutely agree we need to incentivise the use of empty homes being brought back into use and also perhaps put disincentives to people to hanging on to empty homes that are not used productively. Happy to keep the member updated. And briefly, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. Compulsory sale orders would be another um, lever that local authorities could use to get these properties back into use, and the government consulted on the introduction. I wonder if it's still the government's policy to support that um, introduction and what the government has done to work through some of the human rights issues the Cabinet Secretary mentioned last time in the Chamber. Cabinet Secretary. Um, uh, the member is uh, aware, uh, as I am, of the ECHR uh, implications for compulsory sales orders, and they do continue to receive careful consideration. And I'd be happy to uh, update uh, Mark Griffin on this uh, at a, a point at which there's more information available, if that would find that helpful. Question five is not lodged. Question six, Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on progress with its tackling child poverty delivery plan, including in relation to expanding free school meal provision. Cabinet Secretary. So we are focused on delivery of the wide-ranging actions in Best Start Bright Futures and will lay uh, a statutory annual progress report before Parliament by the end of uh, June uh, 2023. In relation to free school meal provision, Scotland already has the most generous provision of free school meals anywhere in the UK, with 362,000 pupils benefiting from support during term time, saving parents £400 per eligible child per year. And this includes all pupils in primaries 1 to 5 and eligible pupils in primary uh, 6 to X S6. Recent additional investment announced means we'll expand free school meals for all primary 6 and 7 pupils in receipt of the Scottish Child Payment. Monica Lennon. I am grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for that update and welcome the Government's commitment to the rollout of universal free school meals. Six months ago, the Government said it would pilot universal free school meals in secondary schools. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm which schools are involved and how the pilot is going? And will she or relevant minister agree to meet with me and campaigners, including the Scottish Youth Parliament and the SUC Women's Committee, to see how we can speed this up? 
Come on, say. Um, I'm happy to uh, make sure that Monica Lennon is furnished with the, the information about which schools. I don't have that information in front of me, and I'm sure we'll make sure that she can have a, a meeting with the relevant minister uh, in order to, dis to discuss those issues in more detail. Supplementary, Emma Roddick. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The IFS has noted that amongst the poorest 30 per cent of households, those with children will see their incomes boosted by around £2,000 a year on average as a result of Scottish Government benefit policy and progressive taxation. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary for her response to this analysis? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I certainly welcome the IFS analysis. Um, and uh, I think it shows the positive impact that progressive choices are having for low-income families, even within our limited powers and budget. And of course, an important part of that are the 13 benefits, seven of which are only available in Scotland, including the game-changing Scottish Child Payment. That's in marked contrast to what is available uh, in the, the rest of the UK, and particularly the UK government's uh, welfare uh, system. And I think that shows the difference between our two governments. We want to tackle poverty and inequality, not push people further into hardship. Question 7, Siobhan Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its assessment is of any potential impact that the UK Government's proposed illegal migration bill could have on devolved so social justice powers and the duties of Scottish local authorities. Cabinet Secretary. So we have written to uh, the UK Government to state uh, unequivocally that Scottish Ministers do not support the illegal migration bill. It is imperative that safe and legal routes exist for people seeking safety and protection from war and persecution, yet this bill will remove the right to seek uh, refugee protection and, of course, risks pushing people into exploitation and destitution. Uh, we should be upholding the UN Refugee Convention, not undermining its international protection. So we are currently considering the detail of the bill, including the impact on people and services, uh, as well as considering any legislative consent implications. Siobhan Brown. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Immigration Law Practitioners Association says that the clauses of this bill dealing with modern slavery and tra trafficking breach the UK's obligations to victims of trafficking under Article 4 of the European Convention on of Human Rights. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if she agrees with me that not only are the actions of this UK go government deeply immoral, but they are also illegal? Well, the Home Secretary, of course, was unable to state that this bill's provisions were compatible with the European Convention on Human Rights, which tells us all we need to know about this abhorrent legislation. And, of course, it follows on from the Shameful Nationality and Borders Act and a further restriction on the provision of support to human trafficking victims penalises particularly vulnerable people, people who have suffered uh, unimaginable trauma, including sexual exploitation or being forced through violence to work for no pay. And they will be prevented from accessing the safety and support available to them in the UK. And of course, Importantly as well, children will be left in a shocking position until they turn 18, where they will uh, then be detained and removed to a third country where they have no connections or family. That is shocking and cannot be allowed to happen. I would have thought the whole chamber would agree with that. Supplementary, Foisal Chowdhury. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The, EG, the UK government's illegal migration uh, bill is likely to have a significant impact on migrants and asylum seekers in Scotland. Scotland's legal profession alone will likely have their caseloads skyrocket under the provisions for removal in the bill. Many asylum seekers that have arrived in the UK and Scotland have risked their lives and arrived with nothing. It is likely any legal assistance many asylum seekers will require would have to be pro bono. Will the Cabinet Secretary advise what the, uh, the potential impact of this bill will be in, on Scotland's legal aid service? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think Foisal Chowdhury raises one issue of which there are many about the impact of this uh, legislation. Uh, and of course, the, the real concern is that it leaves more people destitute without recourse to public funds. And that, of course, has a major impact 
uh, on services as well as the impact to the individuals themselves. So we will continue uh, to do what we can by supporting third sector organisations, some of which, of course, are involved with the issues of legal support and legal advice. Um, and we will look to see what more we can do. But let's be under no illusion this legislation will have a profound impact uh, on those affected and on services here in Scotland. And we should all unite in condemnation of the UK Government over this move. Question number eight, Tess White, who joins us remotely. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what action it's taking to support local authorities to ensure the provision of local services, including swimming pools and leisure centres, and meeting the needs of local communities. Minister Ben McPherson. The Scottish Government believes that everyone should have access to local sport and leisure facilities uh, that help to support the physical and mental health of the nation. Uh, we understand the challenging financial circumstances faced by local authorities, uh, significantly due to the cost of living crisis. Uh, for its part, the Scottish Government has increased the resources available to local government by over £793 million in the financial year 2023-24, to 24, uh, a real terms increase of £376 million, or 3%. Tess White. Minister Buxburn swimming pools is, swimming pool is much loved and a hugely valued community resource, but it's due to close on the 16th of April because of devastating cuts to sport Aberdeen's budget by Aberdeen City Council. It's the only pool in Aberdeen to have, have a shallow stair entry for the elderly and disabled, and it's used twice weekly by additional support needs department of Bucksburn Academy, with the nearest pool two bus rides away, and more than 8,400 people have signed a petition to keep it open. Will the Scottish Government uh, intervene with Aberdeen City Council and Sport Aberdeen to give hope to the local community and save Buxburn Swimming Pool. Minister. Um, I thank the member for their question. and We are aware of the decision taken by Aberdeen City Council to close the Buxburn Swimming Pool uh, and understand the disappointment that members of the community feel at this closure. However, the Scottish Government uh, also uh, understands that um, while everyone should have access to, to local leisure facilities. It is for local authorities to, to manage their own budgets and to allocate the total financial resources available to them, including on leisure facilities on the basis of local needs and priorities. Uh, that saying, um, I, we of course note the members' points um, and following the financial package announced yesterday by the UK Government to support swimming pools in England, we are examining what support can be provided to the sector in Scotland. Uh, if the member wishes to submit any further uh, follow-up correspondence to this question uh, to, first of all, the local authority, uh, but also to Scottish ministers, we will, of course, look at that. And brief supplementary, John Mason. Thank you. I uh, very much welcome the £13.5 billion uh, local government settlement. I wonder if the, if the Minister can say any more about the New Deal for local government, and especially around the area of fiscal flexibility. Minister. Yeah, the, the Scottish Government is committed to working with COSLA and SOLAS to agree a new deal for local government with the aim of agreeing shared priorities and providing greater flexibility over local funding with clear accountability for delivery on shared priorities and outcomes. Uh, and it's very important to consider the point that these are shared. Uh, the new deal for local government reflects a desire on both sides to reset the relationship between the Scottish Government and local government. Uh, and the Deputy First Minister made clear in his letter of the 15th of December to the COSLA President uh, that we want to develop such a partnership agreement uh, at pace and look forward to doing that. Thank you very much, Minister. That concludes portfolio questions. There will be a brief pause before we move to the next item of business to allow the front benches to change.